thank you everyone for joining us tonight for our discussion about secular rituals and ceremonies. First, before we begin, I do want to acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Coquitlam First Nation. I encourage each of you to reflect on where you are coming from and feel free to share it in the chat. My name is Ian Bushfield. I am the Executive Director of the British Columbia Humanist Association. Tonight's event is with Megan Sheldon, the co-founder of Be Ceremonial. Be Ceremonial inspires you to create your own ceremonies across the life cycle, drawing on hundreds of universal rituals. Megan is a cultural mythologist, secular celebrant, and end-of-life doula who is striving to change the cultural narratives around death, dying, and grief. For those of you who aren't familiar with humanism, it is a worldview that promotes free inquiry, science, and compassion, and in many cases tries to provide ceremony at those times that is traditionally handled by religious faiths. And finally, as a small charity, we rely entirely on your donations to make our work possible and these events possible. If you're not a member yet, please go to bchumanist.ca slash join to sign up or make a one-time or monthly donation at bchumanist.ca slash donate. Our big announcement is that next week we will be releasing our new updated end of life guide. This is a new ebook. It features a chapter from Megan. Uh, stay tuned on our website, bchumanist.ca, as well as our email newsletter for more details on that. It's very exciting. Uh, Sophie, who I see is here, helped work on that. And it's uh, quite the project and accomplishment. I'm very looking forward to that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Megan to talk to us about creating secular ceremonies and rituals. Awesome, thank you, Ian. Hello, everyone. Nice to see some of you. Um, I, yeah, I've got um, a lot to cover tonight, and I also want to kind of ease in, um, you know, gently and start kind of from the beginning because I don't know what everybody's relationship right now is like with ritual and ceremony. So I kind of want to start at the beginning, and I'll go through um, the way that I work with ritual and ceremony and the things that I've uncovered over the last decade. And then I'll save some time for some questions where we can get into any specific needs that you might have, um, or, you know, challenges or ceremonies that you're trying to step into right now. So as Ian shared, um, I'm a life cycle celebrant. So I'm trained um, as a celebrant, it's, I was doing it far beyond, far before I realized it was actually a profession. Um, I'm a natural convener and gatherer, so I, um, you know, I, I look back in my in my early twenties, and I was living in Scotland and convening and gathering everybody that was from Canada for Canadian Thanksgiving, and finding out what our home rituals were, and inviting people to share that as a way of connecting. So for me, I think ritual has been part of my life for as long as I can remember. I just didn't know that's what it was. Um, I think it really started to to hit me how how little like, little of a connection I had with ritual and ceremony. Um, first, when my husband and I decided to get married, um, the interesting part about that time was his father had just been given a terminal diagnosis. So we knew that our family coming, his family coming from Sweden, and my family here in Canada. This would be the only time our families would be together intact and, and complete. And so I really wanted to carve out space within our wedding for the grief um, that we were feeling. And that's not a traditional, um, typical thing, especially in Western society, to create space for grief within a joyful celebration. Um, and I had a lot of pushback from people that were um, you know, part of it. And it was uh, something that was really important to my husband and I. And so we kind of got the traditional wedding script and we threw it out the window and we started from scratch. And we thought about what what really we wanted to, to declare and, and what the weekend was about. Um, for those of you who are familiar, we got married in the middle of a storm on the beach in Tofino. So we, um, one of the words that guided us through our decision-making process in our ceremony creation was wild. So I feel like the the storm delivered. We got that wildness. Um, yeah, that that experience of having you know my own relationship with what I wanted that day to be like, and my husband's, and then all the other things that the the world threw at us, and finding ways to create rituals that allowed us to acknowledge what we needed to move through, um, and ultimately that rite of passage um, coming together. So that was my first real formal ceremony that I I created from scratch. Um, and little did I know that over the next two years, my husband and I would go through recurrent pregnancy loss, um, which is a very invisible type of grief. 
And there is no ceremony that was offered or, or given to us um, by our, um, our community, by the hospitals, by the medical system. So I really had to start from scratch there and, and think about what was it that I was grieving. Um, and it's not just the miscarriage itself, it's not just the baby. You know, you look at when you reach um, a, a due date. Um, I was pregnant several times with different friends. So you watch their milestones come and that grief kind of resurfaces. And so what do you do on a due date when you're not delivering a child that you had hoped to deliver? What do you do a year later on that death anniversary? So I got really interested in these seemingly invisible moments, these moments that we don't necessarily know what to do, where to start. Um, there's no roadmap in front of us. Um, I became an end of life doula. I, I felt really drawn to the end of life space, especially as somebody who identifies as secular, a humanist. Um, I don't have strong you know, connections to my cultural heritage, although that has started to shift as I've spent a lot of time looking back in my lineage. Um, in, a, in an effort to avoid cultural appropriation and also an, in an effort to understand where I come from and, and what my ancestry has kind of passed down to me through them. Uh, so yeah, this, this journey for me has been um, a lifelong journey, but really kind of more formally the last 10 years. Um, I have a five and seven year old child now, so that is a whole different relationship with ritual and ceremony. Um, children are naturally ceremonial. I've learned so much through them. Um, they crave the structure of ceremony and the creativity that it can bring. So I've been um, really interested in kind of giving them some of the, the tools and the platform and the space for ceremony to exist and then seeing what they come up with and what they create, um, especially around grief. You know, I'll find my five-year-old in the garden and she's found a dead bee and I'll I'll come up and I'll listen behind her and ask what she's doing. And she said, oh, mom, I'm, I'm doing a ritual. I'm saying goodbye to the bee. I'm thanking it for the flowers and I'm, I'm having a moment and she doesn't want me there. She's having, she's communing with this bee at this. So um, I think I've really just been fascinated by the fact that at some point in our lives, we are naturally ceremonial. We are curious about ritual. We crave marking these times of change. You know, when you're when you're three years old, when you're five years old, when you're seven years old, you know, there's big changes happening and you want to commemorate them. You want to kind of move through this rite of passage. You want to kind of look at, I just started kindergarten and, you know, this, this big deal. And as we get older, those moments become less, uh, not less important, but less visible. You think about when you start a new job or when you get fired from a job, um, when you start a new friendship um, or when you lose a friendship, what are the things that we can do to commemorate those beginnings and those endings? And I think that's where I have really learned to lean into ritual and lean into ceremony. So what is ritual? What is ceremony? Um, I'm going to start this off by saying that my number one rule for myself and for the work that my husband and I are doing in this space is my definition does not need to be your definition. Um, we are trying to avoid the prescriptive nature of ritual and ceremony. Um, that does not mean that there's not a place for it. Um, you know, there is a place for rituals that have been passed down for um, for centuries and for religious rituals that are very rigid and um, repeated in a certain way. Um, and tonight we're, we're talking about something different. We're talking about the, um, the ability to look at ritual and ceremony as something that meets us where we're at. It connects with um, our current circumstances. We can draw on ancient wisdom um, and I'll touch upon a little bit tonight on cultural appropriation and avoiding it in our ritual practice. Um, but really, it's about kind of reflecting our own needs, and my needs will be different than yours. But there's also a structure. There's, um, you know, I've done all this research, and I have a master's in cultural mythology uh, from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. So for me, I really dove into the idea of kind of the collective unconscious and this Jungian kind of mentality of looking at rites of passage and storytelling and archetypes and how we move through times of change. And ritual and ceremony is very much embedded in that. So my, um, you know, if you Google or go into Wikipedia and type in what is a ritual, um, three of the words that you're likely going to get um, are religious, repeated, and rigid. Um, so 
I don't use any of those words. <laughs> I, I kind of look at those words and okay, okay, there is a place for that for some people. What if I need something different? And so the definition that I've come up with for myself and for the work that my husband and I are doing with Be Ceremonial is a ritual is an intentional, symbolic action that hopes to create meaning. I'm going to break that down a little bit for you. Um, an intentional, symbolic action that hopes to create meaning. Intentional. So at the core of ritual is intention. It's the, the idea that you're like, why are you doing this ritual? What is it that, you're hope, that you hope it will solve or will address or acknowledge? So if we think about um, a wedding, you want to choose a ritual around grief. Why? What is the intention of it? And for, for us, it was around acknowledging the elephant in the room, that there was grief that we were all feeling. We wanted a ritual to help kind of bring it to the surface so that it wasn't kind of pushed off to the side. So that becomes the the um, the intention. If we think about symbolic. Um, there's so many different types of symbolism. There's personal sy symbolism, things that are meaningful to me. There's family symbolism, things that might be kind of um, you you as a family or a small group of friends. You might have these kind of rituals that only you connect with and these symbols. Um, there's a larger community. So whether we're looking at, you know, the city of Vancouver or Canada um, or, you know, a culture of people, there's, there's symbols that connect that group, that larger group. And then there's universal symbols. So these are the things that connect us around the world. And um, I'll give you a few examples just to, to bring it home a little bit. Um, I have this beautiful teacup. And on it, it says the word illuminate. And I, my friend made this for me in January and I can pick up this teacup and I can create a, a daily ritual with it. And I'm specifically choosing this teacup because it was made by my friend. So uh, my, my symbolism is kind of drawing back her and her gift to me and also the, the word illuminate and what it means to me this year. Um, you can come in and take this teacup and drink from it and not connect at all with that personal symbolism. Um, but if we think about universal symbolism, we can all sit here together tonight and light a candle and hold a moment of silence. And we're all going to have some connection to that ritual. Um, we're going to realize that there's a symbolic nature to lighting a candle that connects us um, and well, you know, honors us to take a, a moment of reverence, a moment of, of quiet, a moment of reflection. So we've got intentional, we've got symbolic, and then an action. So... A ritual is doing something, even if that means doing nothing. I often say that, you know, if we think about in Canada here um, around Remembrance Day, we'll take a moment of silence. So the action is having a moment of silence. Um, when I had my miscarriages, I went down to the beach and I would find rocks on the beach and I would sit there and I would kind of hold them in my hand and imbue them with my, my grief, my sadness, my guilt, my, you know, all the things that I was feeling. And I would take out a pen and I would write a name or a word or a wish on that rock. Um, so my, my intention was to honor and acknowledge my grief. My symbol was like taking this rock. And then the action was taking that rock and throwing it into the water. And that release of the rock kind of helped me release some of the, the grief that I was holding. Um, so that action became part of the ritual itself. And then the final part is the hope of creating meaning. Um, and this is what I really want to stress as we all step into this new relationship with ritual and ceremony is it's not going to work all the time. You're going to try a ritual in your life and it's going to fall flat. You're going to try to bring together a group of friends or you're going to, you know, you're going to be at a family dinner and you're going to try a ritual and you might get the intention and the symbolism and the action but you might not, not everybody will have the same connection, the same feeling of meaning that you might get from it, um, or it might kind of not quite work for you. And so if we come back to that original definition of repeated, religious, uh, rigid, um, a ritual does not need to be repeated. You can try something once and never do it again. That's, that's in my book, how I approach it. Um, when a ritual does create that meaning and it does actually support my mental health and, and the way that I'm moving through these times of change, I'll often come back to it again and again um, because it's serving a purpose. It's helping create that meaning. So is that uh, clear? I know we, I can only see a few thumbs up, but uh, 
thumbs up for them. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Ryan and Jillian and Kasha. Um, so if, if a ritual is something that we can do as a standalone, um, and it, again, where, you know, it can be something that moves in and out of our lives at different times, what is a ceremony? So for me, um, I draw upon the idea of a traditional rite of passage. And a traditional rite of passage um, has three stages to it. And there's a lot of wonderful, there's a wonderful Canadian writer, if you're wanting to dig a little bit deeper, he's still alive, he's still teaching in Guelph, I believe. His name is, his name is Ronald Grimes. Um, and he's written um, some phenomenal books on kind of the, the structure of ritual. And it's very academic. Um, but it's also, it gives us a really good place to start because he's kind of taken out all the, the religious aspect of it and kind of put in and really uncovered what is it that's happening when we move through a ceremonial kind of time in our life. And, you know, we look back 100, 200, 500 years and all of, uh, there's a lot of moments that were recognized, you know, coming of age, um, you know, uh, for a woman kind of uh, moving into that croning phase of life right? after children, after menopause, how do we kind of move through a childbearing stage in life and then move into the third chapter? So that there was a lot of rituals and ceremonies that surrounded these moments of change that a lot of us have lost touch with. So a ritual can be something that stands alone on its own, or you can weave it together as part of a ceremony. So the traditional rite of passage has three stages. The first stage is around separation. It's finding a ritual that helps you let go of something, release something, honor the past in some way. So thinking about what you're separating from. If you think about a, um, a wedding, uh, the, you know, there might be a ritual which kind of acknowledges that you're letting go of your singlehood, your, your time alone. Um, and so you might choose a ritual to honor that in some way. The middle stage of the rite of passage is that liminal space. Um, it's that space in between where we're kind of, we're neither here nor there. And finding a ritual to acknowledge that in-betweenness can be a really powerful part of a ceremony. And then the third part is what Ronald Grimes called the incorporation. So this is taking what you've learned through the ceremony experience and incorporating it into your life moving forward. His words, I think, are um, separation, transition, incorporation. Mm, a little bit academic. <laughs> not, that, not that approachable, not that accessible. So I started really thinking about what is it that's going on here? And I, um, the definition that we use in our, in our platform and in the work we do is creating a ceremony that helps us acknowledge what was, what is, and what will be. In the past, the present, the future, however you want to um, frame it. So a ritual, um, I mean, a ceremony is the stringing together of these rituals. And I like to think about it, the ceremony is a big cooking pot and the rituals are the ingredients that you throw inside. So everybody here can take the same five ingredients, um, for, you know, five rituals, but then you throw them in the pot and they're going to cook differently in your home versus my home, the temperature outside, the, the time of day, the time of year. So all of those variables will impact your ceremony so that we all will have our own unique ceremonies, which in my mind is the goal. I don't think we, you know, if we think about a lot of the weddings that you've been to, they might all feel like they're the same wedding over and over again. And that's, that's missing out on a lot of the possibility and the creative potential that a ceremony can bring. A ceremony can be a true reflection of, of who we are, what we value, what we believe, um, and also who is coming together around us. Um, as, a, as a celebrant, I create a lot of ceremonies for people, and my number one hope is always to make people participants in the ceremony. I hate the idea of like the voyeurism, the, you know, sitting at the back and watching a funeral take place and leaving and feeling like your grief was never acknowledged, like you're, you were there, but you weren't really part of it. How do we shift that? And how do we invite people, even if they're not, they don't need to get up and speak, but they can do something. They can think about ritual in a way that impacts their own life and their own grief and their own joy. So if we think about the ceremony as this kind of, uh, you know, it can have three rituals, it can have five. You can, it, it's again, this is where we get to be creative. We get to mix and match and, and create something that's meaningful to us. But that's what we're 
you know, for today's purposes, and if you're watching the recording, um, this is the idea of thinking about a ritual as something that we can do with that intention and the hope of creating meaning. And then if we feel like there's a need for a larger ceremony, it's choosing rituals to string together um, to build that moment that acknowledges change or transition. And the work that I'm really passionate about, I often talk with people about what they're familiar with and when it comes to ritual and ceremony. And um, usually people kind of connect ceremony with birth, marriage, and death. So I have a lot of friends. I'm in my mid-40s now. I have a lot of friends who never got married and never had kids. So they're thinking, great, I have to wait till I die to have a ceremony. <laughs> this is this is what I'm looking for. Where do this is where's my you know, where's my chance? Where's my opportunity to be celebrated through that ceremonial kind of gateway that often happens? Um, but if it doesn't happen, if you don't have kids or you don't get married, or you do things in a in a less conventional way. So I'm really passionate about trying to highlight those seemingly invisible moments. Um, just to give you a couple of examples, um, I've been working with the organ transplant community here in British Columbia um, and looking at how can we create a ceremony for an organ transplant recipient who is about to lose an organ from their body, something that they were born with, something that has probably given them a lot of pain and grief, but also has kept them alive. There's that two-sided coin. How do we help them acknowledge what was and let go of something to do with that? I mean, you know, not physically speaking, but emotionally, uh, mentally, spiritually, even if they choose. And then how do we create a ritual that helps them be present? And then how do we think about what they're going to, what do they need moving forward? What are they going to carry with them through this organ transplant experience as they receive an organ from another body, likely somebody that's deceased. And then now they're going to have that organ within them. And the, the interesting fact is this is groundbreaking for the hospital system. There, nobody has looked at this at all. They've only focused on the physical wellness of a patient through an organ transplant surgery. They might have a meeting with a counselor to make sure that somebody's, you know, um, not, not too depressed and that their mental health is in check. But the idea of acknowledging all the different transitions that somebody would face through this experience, through something like ritual and ceremony, um, you know, it, it's fairly new in our Western constructed society. You know, you look back on, obviously, organ transplant is fairly new in general. Um, but there were so many moments that we used to commemorate and uh, acknowledge and mark um, that we just don't anymore. So that's been a, a real focus is thinking about how can we bring these um, these moments for intention and, and symbolism and meaning back into our lives. And I often say that um, I, I train a lot of end of life doulas who are you know wanting to sit vigil and and be with the <clears throat> sorry be with the dying. Um, and they say, how, how do I bring up this with a family that I'm supporting, with a client, with a, you know, I have a family member who just would never do anything like this. The biggest barrier that I think a lot of us have is we have these preconceived notions about what ritual and ceremony is. We have baggage. Um, and so we have to kind of unpack our baggage and realize what is it, you know, why am I resistant to this? And a big part of my baggage um, and my my daughters will laugh because they they think I'm a witch and a mermaid kind of built into one because I swim in the ocean year round. Um, but for me, the idea of ritual and ceremony was so woo woo and and out there and metaphysical, and it's not really who I am. Although I, you know I, I love parts of it, um, but I had to kind of break down my own barriers of what rich what I thought ritual was and and how I'd seen it displayed in the world. And instead, come up with my own version that suited me, that reflected who I was. So that continues to be um, a journey of, of uncovery and learning and unlearning. Um, I mentioned a little bit about cultural appropriation. And I think back to ceremonies that I did 10 years ago, and I incorporated rituals then that I, I would not incorporate anymore because I've learned. I've, I've, I've learned the... Um, through difficult conversations, through being called out and called into these conversations from Indigenous people, from BIPOC people, is really kind of 
understanding what are the rituals that are universal? What are the rituals that are accessible to all of us? And where are the where are those lines where it says, no, this is actually a, a deeply spiritual and personal um, ritual that belongs to a, a culture, it belongs to a religion, or belongs to a, a place in the world. And how can we respect that? How can we say, okay, that's that's interesting. And I'll, I'll give you an example because I think that's often, that's how I learn best. Um, so when I finally did have my first daughter, um, I invited a woman to come in and create what we call the blessing way at the time. Um, it's kind of an alternative to a baby shower. Um, they're now often referred to as mother blessings because the blessing way term is a Navajo term. Um, I didn't know this at the time. But this woman came in and, and she was um, a white settler and she brought in white sage and did a smudging. Um, so this was about nine, eight, eight years ago. Um, it was beautiful, you know, in, in all honesty, it was such a powerful moment because I had so much, like so much things to release. I just come through three miscarriages and pregnancy losses. I, I was so scared. I was stepping into motherhood with so much trepidation and so much fear. So this ritual that she did truly it was, felt like a cleansing. It felt like I, w I was able to kind of release part of my grief and sorrow. Um, over the course of the last eight years, I have had so many conversations with Indigenous people, specifically here in, in British Columbia. Um, and I've learned a lot. Um, White Sage has gone shot up in prices because it has become something that is commercialized. Um, the term smudging is very much an Indigenous term. Um, it is not to be used by, uh, we, we've been asked by Indigenous people to not use it within our, our own ritual practices. So there was a kind of initial guilt and shame and confusion. Oh, I can't believe I did that. Like, what am I supposed to do now? Um, but then came this beautiful opportunity for learning. And so I have Celtic ancestry, and I part of why I studied in Edinburgh and Scotland was to reconnect with my, my great-grandmother and great-grandfather's um, story. I had letters from them. So I took this opportunity to spend and think, okay, what would my ancestors have done? And what have other cultures around the world done? And I learned the term smoke cleansing. And multiple cultures around the world, including um, the Celtic pagan people, um, would use smoke cleansing as an opportunity to both um, symbolically and um, medicinally cleanse spaces. So I, in my own lineage, uh, my ancestors likely, I have no direct proof of this, but there are stories that are passed down, the oral culture, um, would burn dried lavender and heather. So I now feel if I chose to have some kind of spiritual you know, or, or, or symbolic um, smoke cleansing, I could draw on dried lavender and dried um, heather, and I could have my smoke cleansing that gives me that feeling of what I need to do in that moment without culturally appropriating from someone else, um, and also sharing the story of of how we're how we're moving through these conversations and how we're learning and unlearning along the way. So I hope that gives um, and it. If you are in your own world um, doing smudging and burning white sage, this is not, I'm not here to, to shame you. Um, I'm just here to kind of show a little bit of the trajectory that I've been on. And this has happened in multiple different um, rituals that I've stepped into and stepped away from is I'm learning on my own journey what I feel comfortable with. And I invite each of you to kind of have that lens as you start to think about the rituals that you're drawn to. Um, and you can research, you can ask questions, you can find people, you know, um, a lot of the, the weddings and funerals that I'll do, if somebody really wants um, an indigenous smudging, they, they may choose to bring in an indigenous person and pay them and have them be part of the ceremony um, and, and involve them that way. So there are a lot of um, opportunities for us to, to shift our thinking around how we approach ritual and ceremony. Um, but for me, it doesn't always have to be spiritual. Um, it, you know, it's something that's kind of, it's more for my mental health, my emotional health. It's about acknowledgement, moving through these times of change and processing. And the, the gift has been that I've actually connected with my own self and my own heritage, my own lineage in a much deeper way than I ever would have had I not been called out 
you know, seven years ago for a difficult, into a difficult conversation. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a, an idea of what we're, what we're working with when we think about ritual and ceremony. Um, another beautiful example that will kind of take this three stage um, approach that I was talking about, maybe a little bit more into everyday practice. Um, during the pandemic, I started cold ocean swimming. I alluded it to it earlier. Um, it was kind of by necessity. There was just so much stress and, and um, anxiety and fear around the pandemic and all, you know, parenting small children. And it was just a lot. And so in February in Tofino, I made my way into the ocean and had this ceremonial kind of dunking to, I was about to turn 40 and I dunked three times to kind of let go of my thirties and all of the, the hardship that they had brought. Um, and I felt so alive. I felt so like in awe and wonder of the world in those moments of being in that cold water. So I came home to Vancouver and I reached out to my, uh, my community, which at the time was a lot of end of life doulas and end of life care providers and funeral directors, people that were holding space for a lot of grief and had nowhere to put it. And so I offered to convene um, a ceremony down at the beach. And the first time, I think about nine people showed up. And I invited everybody to spend about five or 10 minutes walking along the beach floor. You know, just think about something or someone that they're grieving. It didn't have to be connected to death. Um, it could be, you know, they... Um, I think my very first time I was grieving the the closure of the playground, the playground near our house, they'd taken out the swings and they'd put it, tape over it all. And every time I walked by it, I just would burst into tears because it was just this, you know, I was this idea of childhood and, and freedom. And I felt like it was just this big symbol of what my kids were not able to experience. Um, so I invited everybody to walk along the beach, however long they needed, and to choose an object on that walk that was uh, that they were drawn to. It could be something that was symbolic to them or just something that they noticed. And then as they were walking to hold that object in their hands and imbue the, the grief that they were feeling, the emotions they were holding into that object. Um, that object then becomes what's known as a talisman, um, which, you know, it, it kind of holds those properties and Again, we're talking symbolically, you can take this as, as deeply as you want. But for me, it's just this, you know, it's nice to hold something when you're, you're feeling a lot. And then we would come into a circle and we would share. And this is where the, the community ceremony power really starts to happen in, you know, publicly acknowledging what we were each holding and grieving. And we went around and you could hear through people's hesitation, just how, how uncomfortable we are sharing our grief. Um, but also how good it felt uh, to, to share it, to release it, to acknowledge it, to listen to others. And you knew, you know, you saw somebody walking up the beach and coming into the circle and they were carrying a really big, heavy rock or they were dragging a big log. You knew they were carrying something big and you would never have known that had we not created that space for it. So we would go around and we would share, um, you know, our handful of sand or our seaweed or a shell, whatever we were holding and what it meant to us. And then we would go down to the beach and we would, you know, throw it in the water or gently place it in the water. Um, I invited people, if they weren't quite ready to let go of it that week, they could bring it home and try again next week. Again, lots of rules for permission to do what you need to do. Um, the, the prescriptive nature of the ceremony just does not work well for me. I think everybody's going to need a lot of freedom to go in their own direction. So then we were acknowledging the past, coming back to that idea of separation. We were, we were letting go of something. We were acknowledging it, letting it go. And then we were going into the cold water and the power of cold water, which for me is just a, um, an instant presence. There, there's nowhere you can be but, um, but in the moment when you're in you know, eight degree water in the middle of February or March in Vancouver. Um, it, it forces you to just be completely connected to the here and now. Um, yeah, I, I have tinnitus and hearing loss. So for me, my hearing is just suddenly like magically, I can hear things in this different way in the cold water. Um, the colors, you know, the sky changes color. Everything just feels so much more activated. And if we think about the ceremonial structure, I am now in that liminal space. I am now, um, you know, neither here nor there, but I am in the moment, I am present. 
And there's so many times in ceremonies that we forget to do this. Um, if I think back to a lot of, you know, the funerals that I've convened and the celebrations of life and the, the death anniversaries, people are always trying to rush through the ceremony to get to the end. And they forget to take that moment to just be and just think about something that just kind of lowers our, our parasympathetic nervous system, just kind of personally and collectively just kind of calms everybody down and just allows them to, to be with whatever they're feeling, which usually um, is uncomfortable for a lot of people to be with that, that grief or be with that um, anger or the frustration or the fear or the shame or the guilt. Like those are the things that we push through. We, you know, we kind of push down. Um, so if you invite people to pause and be with that, it's, it can be quite uncomfortable. So with our swim, we then come out of the water and we warm up um, and we share what we're going to carry with us for the rest of the day or the rest of the week. Um, what is it that you noticed? What did you feel? What did you see? What did you experience? And everybody goes around and shares. And the beautiful part of that is other people will share and you'll be nodding and saying, oh yeah, I, I, I noticed that too, or I felt that too. Um, or you'll, you'll say yours out loud and be like, oh wow, that's a good reminder for me. I'm going to hold that this week. I'm going to carry that with me. And that's kind of that ritual of, of, of expressing that gratitude or that um, the awe that you felt. And then we go home. And we have been doing it for three years now, every Sunday. Um, for those of you in Vancouver, it is an open group. We have all ages, men, women, showing up um, at different times. Um, and I think the, the power of it has been the, the community aspect. And I think that a lot of times we look at the role of ritual and ceremony as something we need to do ourselves, you know, self-care. But when we think about the power of ceremony, it's about the community care. It's about how do we show up together and create ways for us to acknowledge and support each other going through things that we might never know. Um, and often for our Sunday swims, strangers show up and they find themselves telling us about something big in their life that they didn't even, like a lot of their friends don't even know. But because there's that space, that container that we've created they feel safe to express it. Um, and it's a powerful thing to, to be able to create that community care. And it doesn't, you don't need the ocean. You don't need rocks. You don't need nine people. You can, you know, there, my hope for you tonight is to just really start to see the creative possibilities of what happens when you gather with intention and you look at symbolism and you look at actions that you can do and you look at the hope of creating meaning and it might not work. And so next time you try something a little bit different, maybe your intention wasn't quite clear enough. Um, almost every time I meet with a family to plan some kind of um, end of life ceremony, their intentions are too many. They're, they, they're, you know, they want their, they're, they're having the celebration of life to bring together family, to honor the person who died, to, um, you know, showcase um, some some value of hers to to get really good food. To, you know, they, their their intentions are too many, too far, too wide, and so the likelihood is, and this is usually where I counsel them, is they're not going to do any of those things very well um, because it's they're trying to do too much. They're trying to look at this opportunity, which usually is two or three hours, and shove everything into that. And as we know, the grieving process does not fit into a two or three hour time frame. So what I've ended up doing, which um, I think often surprises people a little bit when they talk with me, is I, I convince them not to do what they think they were going to do. They, they come to hire me for something and they end up not hiring me and going off and, and doing something privately on their own. Um, and the beauty of that is, you know, I, I'll give you an example as I had a... Um, an older mom meet with me and her daughter had died um, from a drug overdose with the opioid crisis um, here in Vancouver. And it had been almost a year and the year date, the death anniversary was coming up and she still hadn't had a funeral or a celebration of life or anything. And she felt really responsible. She felt like she needed to do something. And so she wanted, she was hiring me to create a celebration of life for her daughter. And in conversations with her, I mean, she could barely get through the, the request. And, you know, as I was trying to pull some threads out and be like, okay, what's needed. And, you know, she had a love of animals, maybe we could do this, you know, and I was trying to find these threads and every time it just felt so painful. And I told her, I said, I, I honestly believe that a celebration of life is not what you need right now. I feel like it will do more harm 
to have to come together in a community and celebrate the life of your daughter who you are still actively and acutely grieving. So I told her about the idea of a healing ceremony um, where you know there's no time date on a celebration of life. You, you can do it at any point. You can do it again if you want. I've had multiple people do, do memorial do-overs. You know, they come to me and said, I, I went to my father's funeral five years ago and it was horrible, it offered me nothing. And I say, okay, let's create a new one. Let's, you know, what's stopping us? Where, where are those rules that we think we have to follow? Um, so with this woman, I, you know, in counseling her and, and helping her see that what she actually needed was a ceremony by herself to say goodbye to her daughter um, and to create rituals that were, that were personal and meaningful to her and not have to worry about taking care of a community of friends and colleagues and worrying about, you know, having to be on when she was still so much very, very much in grief. So I still haven't heard from her if if that celebration of life will take place. But I know that she did a healing ceremony and um, I hope it offered her something what she needed. And I think that's that's where we need to not look at the template and be like, well, you know, just because, you know, somebody died doesn't mean we need to have this. There's no there's no rules that, you know, obviously, um, Again, culturally and traditionally, you might have things that you follow because you're, it's expected of you or because you want to lean back on that. And that's okay. You can have multiple funerals. You can have one funeral that offers kind of the more traditional thing. And then a few weeks later, you can do something totally different. Um, there's, there's so much possibility. And I think for me, this experience over the last 10 years of working with other people has proven to me that you know being ceremonial is very much a creative artistic process where we're using our creativity we're kind of moving out of the logic part of our brain um, which is kind of the event planning side and we're moving into the the magic side of it of thinking okay what is it you know what is it that we're doing here why is this important what are the rituals that we can actually um, connect people with and to, um, I'll give you a, a little bit of a, a tour in a minute, but the final one that I wanted to share, I talked a little bit about that pause, that moment in between when we all often forget to slow down. And I was working with a family whose son had died. And in my conversations with everybody I talked with ahead of time in the weeks leading up to the celebration of life, they told me what great hugs he gave. So I asked the mom and I said, you know, I suggested something and she agreed. And in the midst of this, the celebration of life, you know, it's probably a four hour event and the ceremony part that I was convening was about one hour. In the midst of that, I told everybody to stop what they were doing to just kind of take a breath. And then I invited them to close their eyes. And I said, if you don't want to close your eyes, that's okay. Again, lots of permission to opt in or opt out. But I invited them to think about this young man who had died and to picture him giving them a hug. And if they wanted to hug themselves, if they wanted to hug the person next to them, they could. And just take a few moments just to give that big bear hug that he would give and just to feel, feel that connection to him. And I kind of left it at that. It was a little bit vague, um, a little bit of direction, but lots of possibility to kind of opt in or opt out. And the most phenomenal thing happened people kind of looked at me a bit awkwardly and looked at each other awkwardly. We were just kind of out of the pandemic. So hugging was still a new thing. And you could see them kind of hugging themselves and looking at each other and hugging each other and laughing awkwardly. And um, groups kind of huddled together and hugged each other. And then the tears came. And then the laughter came. And then the holding each other came. And then these moments of just pure connection where each person got to kind of express something that they had been holding. I invited them to participate in the celebration of life rather than just sit there and watch it happen. And it was so simple, um, but it was meaningful to the person, you know, to the community. It was that symbolism of bringing him into that space, but there was still the universal connection. So if somebody was there who didn't know him well, they could still connect with that. So those are some of the things that I talk about when I talk about ritual. Um, for those of you who don't know um, or haven't checked it out yet, my husband and I basically took all of this knowledge and all of these ideas and built an app. Um, my husband's in technology. And what was happening during the pandemic is I had people reaching out from France and Philadelphia and New Zealand and asking if I could help create. You know, there's not a lot of people doing the invisible moments um, that I'm drawn to. So I had, you know, an organ transplant patient in Australia and I had 
um, you know, somebody moving and wanting a menopause ceremony in Berlin. And um, I, I realized that we can, we have this ourselves. Like I'm not here to teach people how to do rituals. I'm here to help them remember, because I honestly believe like my children, we are naturally ceremonial. We have this in us already. We just need to pause and, and think a little bit and follow a bit of a structure because structure helps our logical brain and then allow ourselves to be creative and, and explore this in a, a way that's meaningful for us. So Johan, my husband and I, for the last couple of years, we've been taking all of these rituals, all of this structure, all of this knowledge, and we've been building Be Ceremonial, which is a, an, an online platform and an app um, that guides people through the idea of bringing daily rituals into their life or creating larger ceremonies to acknowledge things like uh, pregnancy loss, um, you know, moving out of a, a childhood home or moving into a new home, organ transplants, um, you know, planning a, a living funeral. What does that look like? How do we plan a living funeral when the person who's dying is still here? Um, I work a lot with the medical assistance and dying community. So I have people who come to me and say, I want to be at my own funeral. I don't want to miss it. How can, you know, how can we co-create something that's reflective of, of what I'm feeling now? And then how do we honor things like death anniversaries and those moments that cross time that we we often fail to recognize. And as many of you know, when we don't know what to do, we often do nothing. And that silence can be deafening. Um, it can be really traumatic and isolating for people that are in grief to not feel like they're what they're going through is being acknowledged. And ultimately we kind of push that down and, and move on and it catches up with us. So I hope that's a, a bit of an introduction. I wanted to leave a little bit of time at the end just for some questions. Um, you can pop them in the chat. Oh, thanks, Ryan. Thanks, LJ.